Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to Critical Thinking Live, Friends of Europe's offering online where we bring you influencers, decision makers, people in the know, people who are making things happen across Europe and the world. My name is Damendra Kanani, Chief Spokesperson at Friends of Europe, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Muriel Loriou, who is a business director at Vodafone. We're going to be talking about digitalization, green matters and industrial policy. And so tune in and make sure you stay with us for this next half an hour where we will be posing some important questions from a business perspective. What does it take for Europe to actually up its game? We know that Europe's a laggard in terms of scaling innovation and also it's far behind on 5G technology development. So these are some of the points and issues that we're gonna, I'm going to discuss with Muriel um, so that we can get a better sense of what is it for a global company like Vodafone to operate in Europe. So Muriel, thank you very much for joining us. It's a thank real pleasure much. to have you. You've been, you're a business director at Vodafone. You have a lot of experience in the company, but also working globally. Tell me, you support um, a number of large companies uh, and SMEs, you know, across, across the, the value and su supply chain uh, in any business. What are the current priorities for the businesses that you're supporting, either in Europe or globally? Well, I think their first priority is definitely around digital transformation across the board. And then I would say security uh, is an important one for them. Um, sustainability is growing uh, into the agenda, into the conversation we have with them. And I think, you know, I mean, you're saying we are in a difficult situation, difficult environment, and everybody sense that. So the leaders I'm talking with sense that we may have to go into recession that we are facing all multiple crises at the same time, and they need to like, make sure that their company is kind of really well fitted for purpose, resilient with this crisis that might come through. Energy cost is definitely one big pressure point on top on their side. But yeah, first topic on the agenda is digitalization, uh, moving to cloud, security, uh, yeah, and making sure that they are fully, uh, you know, fit for purpose for, for the next years. And that's a matter for any company across the world, right? You're, you're saying that that's from your experience at the moment with the uh, potential onset of recession, or actually we might be in recession right now, it's just a matter of who counts the numbers. Um, uh, but everyone's feeling those kinds of pressures, you're saying, across the globe. Yeah, I think that what would be different probably would be a bit of the impact. So the European company might be more uh, feeling pressure around supply chain, around competitiveness of their industry towards their global you know, competitors uh, across the globe. Uh, we may have, like Europe, also a bit more uh, under recession or under risk versus the US or the uh, APAC market that are actually still growing well. Yeah? So, so that will be probably the nuance, but they are all getting into the same uh, you know, um, agenda around digitalization and security. And on that point, Muriel, let's move to Europe and Europe's policy ambition is this, you know, this notion of a digital decade and that, you know, um, you know, by 2030 and beyond or even earlier, we will have a whole infrastructure, um, societal infrastructure on digitalization. And we know things are happening at a pace beyond our imagination. Right. And I think there's a sense that people aren't really, really uh, aware of how fast the pace of digitalization is taking place around us in our lives every day. Now, we know that this is a policy ambition from a from a perspective of Vodafone, who's supporting these companies across the world, but also in Europe, what needs to happen, right, for the digital decade to be what it aims to be? And I suppose where I would really like you to go beyond is what's missing right now? Well, actually, I would say considering the tough environment we are in, and also the fact that to be honest with ourselves, I think industry in Europe is lagging behind, and we can actually expand into that. Yes, there are a couple of areas where we need to do more, yeah? and, and we are not yet there into this digital decade agenda. So I think first thing I would say would be we need much more priority and focus from all member states around rolling out critical infrastructure across the board. Uh, I think you know, if we really want to make sure that digital is becoming a priority, we need to start with the key enabler, and the key enabler is about connectivity. And so not having at pace, I mean, just to give you a bit of a, an example, yeah? Please. Today, if we continue at the same trend, we will actually have 60% of 5G coverage across Europe more than 10 years behind China, after China. 
Yeah? So we are lagging behind, we are late, and we need to make sure that we are consistent with our, what we are saying. If digital is a priority, we need to have the priority and the focus across the board. And what I'm saying also across the board is because we need to get the benefit of the, um, of the European single market. Yeah? So if you're doing that as a patchwork of 5G networks, not all at the same time, then you don't get the synergies and the scale you want to have for the industries to be more competitive. That would be first. Mm -hmm. Second topic I think would be around Governments need to incentivize investment mm. much more because they are going to have investment at an unprecedented level. You know? So again, 5G is probably requiring four to five times more investment than what was required for 4G. But even beyond the, you know, in critical infrastructure, you know, digital skills, digital solutions, all that requires investment. So you need to have much more incentives to investment and you need also to remove policy barriers that we still have. Third thing, um, we need to have a much more holistic approach. I think too often, uh, you know, I've been engaging also with governments uh, in, in my previous experience, and uh, I think sometimes it's like always still um, into the one ministry agenda, communication and digital, yeah? And then I think it should be embedded into all sectors, all the government, yeah? If we want to have a digital strategy, it should be across sectors, being again agriculture, environment, transport and industry, energy, uh, ag you know, health, education, anywhere. Yeah? So that's for me where we are missing the synergies of having the full government having a digital strategy and agenda together rather than having one ministry like trying to promote that for yeah. everyone. Um, then I think, you know, speed of ex execution. Let me expand a bit mm. on that. I mean, EU funds was a fantastic and it's still a great opportunity for Europe. Yeah. We've decided that two years ago now, even a bit more, yeah? And where are we so far? I need to you know, say, I don't think we are having enough flow of those funds uh, yet into the markets. A and that's, that's a bit of a shame if I could say so, because maybe there are bot bottlenecks. Maybe there is like a bit of a some challenges around how fast we can actually push those funds, those programs, uh, and we need to make sure we have the right also planning, anticipation around the uh, skill set, the capacity to make sure we can actually really push those programs because otherwise those funds are going to be lost or late uh, and then will not get the full potential of the recovery we were aiming for or mitigating the crisis we are uh, potentially having. Um, or even it could be, you know, reallocated to more short-term tactical, you know, spend that what was the design of the long-term strategy of digital decade. Um, and then the last thing I would say would be probably around, we need to work more together. I see still lots of great initiatives, by the way, uh, across Europe and the member states, and that's fantastic. But I think working together, sharing those learnings, those programs, those initiatives, would really like, enable all of us to learn from it. So again, EU funds, Spain, Italy, they are having a fantastic uh, you know, SME digitalization toolkit in their country with some local flavors, by the way. Some are, you know, Italy is more with connectivity, uh, Spain less, but I think it doesn't matter. I think what matters is really like how they've been setting it up. Now Greece is inspired about that and they're also like uh, having a, a similar program coming up. Mm -hmm. And then it might inspire Romania, Ireland, Portugal, whoever into similar with their local, you know, flavors, but mm -hmm. similar programs. And I think sharing the initiatives mm -hmm but also the learnings, all the challenges they are experiencing right now would actually benefit to all. So much more collaboration would be welcome. An excellent five or six point plan from you, Muriel. I hope that we capture that now. I think people are listening intently with that. And it's very thoughtful and insightful. Who does, if I may, just probe a little bit further, who should take the responsibility for that exchange of learning, right? Could, could you envisage a, a, a situation where Vodafone will say, um, you know what? We'll step up and we'll step in. We'll invest in helping countries and member states to cross-fertilise and uh, really share experience because we see that's in the interest of digitalization, but also we can share our own expertise. Is that something you would even envisage? Absolutely. And that's what we are already doing, by okay. the way. But I, I think so. So we are going to do that. We are already doing that. Yeah. Sharing some of the initiatives we see across Europe. Other private sectors or private, uh, you know, operators could do the same. But I think still the members, the, the, you know, the government should still engage together, uh, facilitated or not by the EU Commission, you know, and at the Parliament. I don't know, but at least they should also have this connection because some of the challenges they have of implementing some of those programs, we might not have full 
visibility or clarity around what are all the challenges. We see some of the you know, bureaucratic burden or you know, again, scarcity of resources and so on and so forth. We are helping on that, even sometimes of like reflecting on how you design the program or the tender or you know, the, 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 the specs, the specifications on, on this and this program. But I, I think they, they need to have more engagement together as well. So you made excellent points about, and I think, I think it's a really good, I mean, so as a think tank, we are promoting this also, so we're, 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 we're consistent in the, about the fact that you need a whole of government approach to digitalization. You're absolutely right. You can't have a ministry. You can't have a DG. Uh, actually, if this is going to work, it has to be everyone's business. It has to be everyone's priority. And it can't be shoved to actually one budget and one director. In the context of what you said earlier, Europe's almost 10 years behind China. And there's a difference of, you know, democracy, approach, etc. They have a different structure of governance. They can make things happen faster than we can here. Um, what needs to happen, do you feel, for uh, Europe to really benefit from scaled up telecommunications network? Because it feels that that's what's missing right now. But what, is, what needs to happen for that to, to take place? Well, I think I need to be a bit provocative here. I think that we are subscaled, yeah? So again, and, and let's not only benchmark against China, but mm. also against the US, yeah? So just, we are having around 100 network operators or providers across Europe, while in the US you'll have three, in China as well, yeah? So we are very fragmented as an industry. And, and that creates lots of challenges because then we don't have, you know, uh, first the, the, the scale at the local level, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, the market structure being healthy enough to make sure we have the right return on investment of what we're doing when we have multiple providers like kind of investing all at the same time. Uh, and we should promote a more healthier uh, market structure here as much as possible, still with competition, obviously, but much more healthier structure. Um, and promote probably as well like network sharing initiatives or co uh, joint venture or co-investment if need be, because otherwise we'll never have this scale at the local level. And then we need also to have regional scale to again get the benefit of the single market. I, I mean, again, if you look at the industry in Europe, first we are the highest capital intensity as a sector by far. Second, our return of capital employed over the last five years has even gone down further from eight to down to 5%, and 5% is quite low, it's actually among the lowest. On top of that, while we are having 40% increase of energy prices, while we are having 10% inflation, we are the only sector being deflationary. So we are actually, and this is not sustainable, obviously, because then it has an impact on you know, less profit, less return, and then immediately delayed, you know, because we don't have the return, so we delay a bit the, uh, rollout of infrastructure, and that has then an impact uh, on the industries missing competitiveness. So Europe competitiveness is also going to depend on the uh, critical infrastructure we are building. So you get delayed, and then if you have local players being too fragile, then you get to foreign investors that might be having other agenda in mind Indeed. or, you know, security <laughs> uh, will be affected. You may have private equity funds taking some shares, but then they will have more short term view than the long term investment you need to do and so on and so forth. So you're getting into a, a bit of a risky situation mm -hmm. um, that, that could jeopardize, I think, the whole continent job uh, competitiveness if we continue like that. But also security. Because actually, when I, can I just pick up on that? It's made me think that what we've done here, clearly from you, and it's great to have your reflection because you've worked globally. We're 10 years behind both China and, and the US. I, it's it's, it's uh, uh, breathtaking when you say there are only three operators uh, or two, and there's like over 100 in the EU. And we've taken a laissez-faire approach. A thousand flowers bloom. Let everything happen everywhere, because actually that's good for, it's almost like classic market philosophy. But when it comes to this agenda, as you say, just when we know the rise of uh, the insecurity around cyber attacks and what um, you know, unpleasant actors globally can do through the internet, through digitalization, we actually need a different approach actually to connectivity in Europe. And perhaps, you know, is, there, is this the time to call out the fact that Europe, um, you have no clothes? It, because when you're thinking about what you're doing, you are making yourself vulnerable, open, and uncompetitive. What's your what's your reaction? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think we are really at a very critical moment of time, because I mean, we are saying digital is a priority, which I think everybody kind of agree on. 
But I think then we need to be consistent between what we say and what we do. And, and, and I think, again, I mean, let's be also honest. I mean, Europe has been, you know, probably favoring affordability for consumer, which is great. Yeah. So we are much cheaper, obviously, also than the US market on the connectivity side, which is great again. But we went to a, a point now where, you know, e even we need to review the policies, we need to review the competition law to make sure again that we have more scale and more long term, uh, you know, resilience even on, on our network. Because now it has become a critical infrastructure like any others. Yeah. Uh, and, and back to your point around security. So I, I think we didn't realize that before in the last decades or even more, it was more around how we democratize telecommunication, which was great. But now we are getting to a point where it's a critical infrastructure. We've seen that during COVID, by the way, again. Indeed. Yeah, it was uh, enabling us to ho work, uh, you know, working from home, homeschooling, health, and so on and so forth. So, and, and I'm coming back to the, the whole scale that then we need to have also at the regional level. Because again, security, when you will have a small local player, how m and nobody will be immune on security, but when you have the scale across Europe, yeah, in terms of the investment and into protecting the network, you, you have you know, much more capacity to invest uh, than obviously when you're like only a local player. Indeed. And I suppose you make the point about COVID really well, because actually imagine a major cyber attack in France. It's not going to have just an impact on France. It will have an impact on the single market. And I think there's a, there's a lack of understanding of the interdependencies uh, uh, amongst the member states whilst they, they, they try and sort of sing loudly from the hilltops about sovereignty and subsidiarity. There is actually, on the digital space, I think what you're saying is um, that might be all well and good, but actually digitalization sees no borders. And actually there is structure that you could create in a market that if you're going to really succeed. Exactly. And that's why I'm like insisting around the regional scale, because exactly to your point, there is no border. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we've seen that. I mean, the, the companies that were the most resilient uh, during COVID time or the countries that were more resilient were the ones that were more digitalized. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we were all having the same impact. It's just that the way we manage the impact then is depending on the, the way you've been already uh, digitalizing yourself. And I think it's like for me, a, a, an important way to mitigate crisis, mm. yeah? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good enabler. Mm. But then you need to really accelerate. And, and if we want to catch up against, again, the, competit you know, the global uh, competition uh, for our industries as well, then we need really to make sure that we, we, we put the, the right means behind Indeed. that. Indeed. So a powerful message you make there, actually, that you know, during COVID, it was those who are more digitalized that could actually weather the storm. And we are seeing a number of storms, and it's likely that we're going to see multiple uh, sequential crisis, whether exactly. they're climate or digital. But you're saying digitalization is your, not your magic magic tool, but it's going to give you more resilience and make, get you out of the storm better. Absolutely. It has been the lifeline during COVID and it will be even more into the next years, you know, your enabler for more resilience. It will decrease. And, and by the way, on that one, we need also to be careful on how we build that because resilience for me is not only around the whole connectivity, it's really the whole digitalization per se, because we need also to learn from COVID and remove or decrease at least some of the critical dependencies we have, uh, you know, on, on the critical sectors we are depending. I mean, we could say energy, we could say food, but security, cyber attacks, cyber defense, those are critical dependencies we need to be really careful about and build our autonomy, our sovereignty. Um, so this requires investment, this requires alignment, across Europe, because again, you cannot have like one way in France to your point and another way, you know, in, in Greece or wherever. So alignment is critical, but investment on this resilience um, and making sure we don't have short memory of what happened during COVID. Excellent point. And unfortunately, human nature is such. Let's move to regulation, Morelli, for me, and as we as we close this conversation, very interesting conversation down. Um, Europe is seen as the global, a global kind of high brand, um, high value uh, actor in regulation. It does the right thing. GDPR has now become that thing associated with Europe, not bureaucracy, <laughs> but actually privacy and data management. Um, we have a slew of initiatives that come out this year that are related to the digital single market, uh, digital, uh, you know, the data act, etc., and so forth, all about balancing values, rights and competition in different ways. Um, we know that uh, all that you've said requires a bit of an upheaval in the rule book 
or the, the, the kinds of approaches you're protecting to, because actually the time is now is what you're saying. And actually Absolutely. If, you do it now, and if you don't do it now, you're really going to be even further behind. In that vein, is the Connectivity Infrastructure Act the right thing? Is that the right vehicle? Is that going to be the thing that responds to all the issues that you've just described? Well, I see it, w it could, but I think first we need to make sure that it's still into the agenda and into the program of the Europe European Commission for 2023, which I'm not completely yet sure about. And I think second, we need to get the learnings of the, the previous kind of directive, which was like the broadband cost reduction directive that was in place like or voted since 2014 and supposed to be in place tw since 2016. What are for me the learnings of that? It was a directive, it was not an act. It was not enforcing things. Uh, it was more like kind of guidance, if I could say so. And so it, it, it has not generated the harmonization that we were requiring for, even per country. Yeah, so, so the experience is still super painful. You know, rolling out network means you need to have access you know, to physical infrastructure or build new physical infrastructure. And you need to do that at pace to, again, catch up. The bureaucracy, the um, number of papers, the, the red tape, generally speaking, that you know, we still have uh, into so many countries where it can take from five to eight months to even more than a year before we get, even get permits to access or to build new infrastructure. I mean, this is the challenges we are confronted with. And of course, it creates delays, but it's also creating, again, additional costs and then challenges around our return. Because, I mean, all those, you know, all these frameworks should be more reinforced, should be simplified, uh, also be probably a bit more pragmatic. What are we, why are we sometimes so painful on some of those you know, requirements where we know it's an easy rollout to just like put an antenna if, if I could be really like kind of a bit uh, provocative. Yeah. Yeah? So sometimes we have the same constraint uh, on our sector than if you were building a new hospital. And, and I one think size, one size fits all, which <laughs> exactly. makes no sense. Absolutely. So, you know, how we make it simpler, more flexible, more pragmatic, and again, serving the right purpose. We want to have speed. Of course, we need to be careful. Mm. But I think we are like, as an ICT sector, quite mature now uh, to do things much better and faster. People say that you, you have vested interest, right? And I'm going to ask that question very directly. Um, that, you know, you want to all of this because actually, you know, Vodafone wants to shore up the market, be one of the three players, of uh, uh, network players in Europe. But that's not where I'm going to go initially. We as an organisation are really committed to the concept of a renewed social contract. We believe, given all the things you just described, Muriel, about the COVID, how basically governments had to step in, um, and make sure they underwrite and support the continuity and stability of society. And the one thing that enabled them to do that was tax, public, public taxpayers' money. So in effect, it was public revenues that generated through tax that underwrote society uh, during COVID and continues to support all of our arrangements to a certain extent. Um, and even the tax that Vodafone pays goes into you know, a government somewhere which then provides public services. For my, for my, when we think we need to have a better resetting or renewing of the relationship between the public sector, private sector and civil society. And that means it's not about corporate social responsibility for the private sector. We're saying there has to be a more than profit model of business which has a social purpose. Where's, where do you stand as you know, your Vodafone Business Director about the role you play um, in supporting, I can put it in this kind of romantic way, a better society? Completely there. I mean, we, we are having actually one of our priorities, our social contract. And this is exactly about that. It's about digitalization, but it's about inclusion for all. And I'd, actually, I didn't mention that, but I think making sure that with the digital decade, we make sure that no one is left behind. By the way, no business, whether small or large, or public versus p private, but also any people. Yeah. So make sure that you know we, we support here everyone the same way wherever they are they should expect the same quality of public services whether education health connectivity and so on and so forth and yes to be true i mean we may have some challenges in some of the remote areas uh whether vodafone or actually our competitors by the way because it might not be fully making business sense uh to go by ourselves so here we need also having like a a, a, a support but a partnership i would say rather of how we make sure we connect everyone, yeah? Mm. But then, so I would say inclusion for all, 
um, sustainability for me having a more you know greener agenda has a priority making a better planet is definitely part of our social contract as well um, and we could expand on how much you know digitalization or connectivity iot internet of things could really enable that i think we see already benefits of how much digitalization can actually also help you managing better waste water leakage energy Indeed. electricity whatever you want so i am completely with this purpose that we are doing we are building a better society for everyone, more sustainable, you know, and, and hopefully as well also more competitive. Because again, we, we need to be compete at the European level as well. And it's, it, I get a sense that we're only scratching the surface of this debate, but also the, that last point, very important point, is that we haven't really peered into that uh, box of magic that could actually be transformative in terms of digitalization from every a uh, sense of society from a whole of society whole economy approach whether that's to do with energy whether that's to do with education whether that's to, it could even be to do with skills and training and confidence building right through to you know supporting employees uh, in the workplace but also creating innovation um, i'm going to finish on this point imagine you had commissioner breton and the Stager here with me and they may be with us in the next couple of days you never know um, what would you say to them as a, as a leading global business and brand you know what you're talking about. Obviously, they'll assume you have a vested interest, but let's put that aside. Let's, let's hope that everyone's grown up in this. What would you say to them in terms of what they need to change in next year before they think about the next parliament and the new commission? Well, tough one. I would say, you know, I, I think it's, it's really the time. It's really the time where if we all agree that digital is the priority for all, we should all have this has one priority across the whole member states and, and incentivize again the, the rollout, the investment across the board, beyond also connectivity, by the way. Um, I, would, I would say we need to still reduce the red tape um, and, and we need to make sure that we have a um, fit for purpose con competitive framework, yeah? Thank you. That was an excellent conversation, I hope you believe in. Thank you, Muriel, for sharing your th insights, but also the passion. It's great to have a business leader that uh, really has, and that's not against any other business leader uh, at all, but the fact that you have this insight, this passion, but also um, we believe you in what you're saying <laughs> when you're talking, which is great. But, you know, I was recently in Serbia and I've been in the Balkans and it's, you can see what, how, why digitalization not occurring pulls societies back. And when you go into Eastern Europe, in the EU, um, you know, in parts of the Eastern Europe, part of the EU, simply there is no connectivity. And this needs to change. If we are to create inclusive economic growth, 5G and deep connectivity and fast connectivity has to be uh, a biggest policy ambition for this commission, but also the future commission. We look forward to engaging you again. We're very grateful to Muriel for joining us on this Critical Thinking Live. Tune in for our next um, episodes, uh, but also go to our website for our next set of events. And take care, look after yourself, and thank you for being with us. Bye-bye.